introduce you to Sana Giovanni. She's the founder and CEO of the Love Your Natural Self Foundation. She created this foundation when she was in middle school. She's going to tell you about her story. She's also going to tell you about how Rotary impacted her life. Um, as a young girl, she experienced alopecia and had some bullying experiences. And um, she's going to share a little bit about that, too. So she'll share her story. She has earned several distinguished honors, including the Harry S. Truman Scholar, and she's a member of the Disney Dreamers Academy. She's had countless speaking opportunities across the world. And um, she teaches young kids how to love their natural selves and how to kind of combat bullying and what, what the effects of bullying can be. She's been featured in a TED Talk and a documentary. She was on Good Morning America. Um, her undergraduate degree is from the University of Texas San Antonio and her graduate degree is from the University of Pennsylvania. I met Sana when she was an intern at State Farm Insurance in 2016. She was my intern. She was assigned to me. We didn't have a chance to interview or meet ahead of time. I just got an email and said, this is who your intern is going to be. And I started Googling, right? It's like, well, let me find out about my new intern. <laughs> and I saw that she had gone to RILA, Rotary Youth Leadership Award. And um, she also had been you know, in a TED Talk. And I had two. I don't think we were the same year, though. But she is an incredible young woman. She spoke at our district conference uh, a couple of years ago. And I've, I've known her for several years. And I think you're really going to be moved by her story and you're in for a real treat. So I appreciate you all being here and those of you who are going to watch it online too. So Sana, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank y'all. Thank y'all so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and thank you for being patient with my hard 1230 stop. That's our um, that's our staff meeting. And I just happen to be leading today's staff meeting. So I have to be there. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited. I'm just going to jump in. Um, I'm, um, if you could, um, uh, make me a co-host, I could share my screen, but I can go ahead and just start introducing myself in the meantime. Um, Rotary has played a huge, huge, huge role in my life. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I'm very, very excited to be here. Um, but I currently live in Washington, D.C. I, um, there we go. Okay, I think I got this now. Okay, yeah, I'm going to give you all some visuals. Um, but yeah, I'm the community engagement manager at a nonprofit called Generation Hope while also running my own nonprofit. Um, I currently live in Washington, D.C. And a little bit about me before I get into my personal story is that I love to travel for fun. I love to thrift shop, actually. Um, a fun fact is 100% of my wardrobe has been thrifted since about 2017. So um, I really care about sustainability and a lot of other things. Um, but yeah, that my name is Sana and I'm just excited to get into things. Mm -hmm. um, so a little bit about my story and kind of what brought me here um, and to shape and give you all some background. This is me when I was um, really young and one of my first childhood memories being this young was this moment when my mom um, was sitting me on the counter and styling my hair. I was kind of the princess of the house because I was the youngest of five kids. So um, y'all know how that is when you're the baby of the family. Everybody's kind of looking out for you. Everybody's kind of um, really invested in you. So I just remember um, every morning we had this morning routine where all my siblings were getting ready and my mom would sit me on the counter and do my hair. One of the mornings, though, this was really, really different. My mom was doing my hair and I heard her gasp and I heard her start crying. Um, and I turned around to see what was wrong and she grabbed my little hand and she put it on the back of my head and I felt, felt a bald patch about the size of a quarter. I remember feeling a lot of things. I felt some anxiety. I felt a lot of confusion. Um, but more than anything, I think I felt the sensation that I was different and that there was something wrong. And I felt like different was not something you wanted to be. Different didn't feel like a good thing. Um, and so I remember my siblings came into the room and um, you know, that day we went to a doctor and I was soon diagnosed with alopecia areata, um, which for those who don't know, alopecia is an autoimmune disease that causes your body to attack your hair follicles. Um, you know, your body thinks that hair is a disease, so it fights it off. Um, and so I was just losing hair and areas and patches. And so I kind of navigated that growing up. Um, 
unfortunately, my a lot of my siblings um, went off to college and our home situation, our finances started to become tough and a lot of things became really, really turbulent at home. I know that um, my dad started struggling with drinking. He was an alcoholic when I was growing up. We had a dynamic of domestic violence. And so home really, really didn't feel very safe for me. Um, and I know that even though as an adult, I can recognize that it's not my fault to me in my head when I was growing up, the alopecia and a lot of the problems at home and the doctor's appointment, they all kind of started at the same time. So it was hard for me to understand. And I know I grew up with this big sense that like, I wonder if any part of this is my fault or if I could have like done something better and just this frustration that my body wasn't doing the right thing and it wasn't making it any easier. Um, but the one place that felt school safe to me was school and education um, and all of the things that entailed. Um, that became my absolute safe space. There are so many memories that I have of amazing adults who really, really made a difference in my life at school. Um, my family started struggling with finances, for example, so I wasn't able to pack a school lunch. And I remember that our custodian would go around the cafeteria and notice that I didn't have any lunch. So she would go by every single table and find anything that was unopened. And she collected it in a little plastic bag that she hung on her arm. And after she made all her rounds, she'd come and give me that plastic bag filled with all these random snacks that these kids brought to school and didn't eat um, instead of throwing them away. And I remember I, I was so grateful to have something to eat. But I also thought to myself, oh my gosh, whose parents packed them Skittles? I just remember looking through it. It was like a treasure chest. It made lunch really fun. Um, I also remember um, a teacher who would paint my nails because they were always really dirty and alopecia sometimes, um, you know, gives you thinner, more brittle nails. They were always really dirty and they were always bleeding. But I had this teacher who would like do my nails and put fun purple butterflies um, stickers on them. And that meant the world for her to just like sit with me for a moment and do that. And it made me feel um, taken care of. Um, as I got a little bit older too, in um, high school, I found community through my interact club um, and my rotary club. I remember um, just going to interact and feeling like, oh my gosh, there are these students who want to make a difference just like me. Um, and that's really awesome. And so I immediately joined. Um, I learned about Ryla and I knew I wanted to go one day and I'm, I'm going to share some photos at the end. But um, that was another way that school became a safe space. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes that I want to make sure I have time to tell, so I'm going to share it now, is um, I got invited to a rotary meeting because I had joined our interact club. And so they wanted to engage with the local high school. And so they invited all the interactors um, who were in leadership to come to a rotary meeting. And I remember my family was really, really struggling with finances. Like it was one of those situations where my dad's mental illness had gotten a lot worse. So like home did not at all feel safe. And so I went to this rotary club meeting and I found out that they had a lunch buffet um, and I was really excited about that. It was like a Saturday afternoon lunch buffet. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Unlimited food on a Saturday. That's that's awesome. And so I remember, A, I was trying to eat as much as I could eat because I knew I didn't have food at home. Or I didn't know what would be happening. Um, and B, I was just so excited to be welcomed somewhere that felt safe and open. Um, all the adults were so nice to me. Whenever I shared anything that I did in the Interact Club or in my nonprofit, they were so impressed. And um, I just felt so welcome. It felt like a community and a family. And I remember asking okay. one of the vegetarians, how often am I allowed to come back? Like, could I come back some other, other time? And they said... Um, come as often as you want. Like we will sponsor you. If you want to come every week, come every week. We'll never say no to a young person. Um, and boy, did I take them up on that. I came to that Rotary Club um, every week and it was really awesome to have a warm meal every week. Um, I don't think that they realized the impact that that was having on my life. And I remember I would try to, from the lunch buffet, like sneak away things like some extra rolls or some extra food. And um I remember one of the Rotarians noticed that I was doing that and like just started like with a lot of dignity and kindness, like packing me the leftovers at the end and just being like, hey, just take this with you, like if you want it. And so I think like that's the direct impact. Um, I mean, there's this larger impact that I'll talk about, but I think there was like a lot of humanness to Rotary. And, and that's why I just feel such a deep, deep connection um, to Rotary Clubs. And I'm just so happy to be here. And, and these were really my safe spaces growing up. 
So now I'm going to jump a little bit to middle school. Um, I was navigating all of these kinds of dynamics growing up and middle school is really, really when it became hard. And a lot of that is because I, um, my alopecia started to progress and I was going through a lot of stress and just, you know, I feel like every group that I talk to, I ask people, um, raise your hand if your favorite period in your life was middle school and nobody has ever raised their hand uh, because middle school is tough. You're like kind of figuring out who you are and it's a tough time. And um, I was in my seventh grade year and I'll never forget it, but I was in my seventh grade year. It was about midway through the year. Um, and I went to bed one night and I woke up and the next morning, something instantly felt different. Something felt off about my body, about how it felt my head almost felt lighter. And so I remember just like feeling my head to kind of try to understand what was going on. And when I did it, I ran my fingers through my hair and I got the biggest chunk of hair that I could have possibly gotten. And I looked back at my pillow and there was so much hair and I started to feel my head and I could actually feel my scalp. And overnight I had lost almost 75% of my hair. Um, Sometimes alopecia can express, um, you know, can go really rapidly, especially um, at ages where um, your body is growing a lot and developing a lot. And so my alopecia overnight had gotten really, really, really bad. Um, and I had to walk into school that way at 12 years old. And that was really scary. Um, I had to watch my hair fall out strand by strand. And I remember when I walked into school, the bullying was truly endless. At first, it started off like whispers. Um, you know, people were asking what happened to her hair? Why is she wearing a wig? Um, you know, why does she look so different? And by the way, my wig was not at all subtle because mm -hmm. it had to be a wig that we could afford. And I remember my mom had to go find a wig and she didn't speak much English. And so the only thing that she was able to find was this costume store that was open year round. And so my first wig was bright red. Um, and that's not my natural hair color. Um, and so that was really hard. I had to go to school wearing a bright red wig when I used to have short black curly hair um, and everybody knew it was fake. Um, and there was not a lot of kindness that was brought with that. Um, and so eventually there was an online burn page where people wrote mean things and guessed all the reasons that why I was wearing a wig. So it was literally a Facebook page titled the Sana Burn page where people could post statuses. Um, I found mean notes in my locker one even titled 50 ways to go kill yourself. Um, I faced a lot of physical bullying. Like I was pushed around a lot. I'd find gum in my wig and every day I was just scared. I was really, really, really scared. I realized something though. I realized that people said mean things to me. However, the things that I was saying to myself were so much worse. Um, I was the meanest voice in my head and I knew that in order to feel better, I couldn't change what the bully said, but maybe, maybe I could start to change the voice in my own head. And so I worked on that. I realized that when you have low self-esteem and you combine it with bullying, you start to develop this behavior called self-bullying. And I thought, you know, nobody seems to like me at school or nobody seems to um, want to be my friend. But I had to ask myself, like, I need to lead by example and I need to learn to like myself and maybe maybe if I love myself so hard, other people will start to love me a little bit more. And that's kind of the approach I took. And so every time that I struggled with self-bullying, I tried to identify it. Um, I identified it as the times where I said things like, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. And I'm going to fail. Um, and as I struggled with my mental health, um, I tried to identify all the things that I was doing um, and that I was saying to myself that maybe I could just flip and be a little kinder to myself. And I really had to ask, how many times have you said something negative to yourself? And what can you do to make it stop? How can you work on that? Um, there was a moment for me that I hit rock bottom that I knew I really, 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 I was starting to realize some of this stuff in real time. I was going through school. And then I remember this moment where I knew like, okay, we really need to turn this around and take um, you know, my mental health seriously. And that moment was this moment where I came home from school. I was in the eighth grade. Um, so flash forward about a year and a half from when I first lost my hair. And my mom was sitting on the couch holding a letter. And it basically said that I had missed um, 
about 50% of the school year and I was failing all my classes. And for someone who used to see school as a safe space, this was, this blew my mind. I used to be so good at school. Like I was the kind of student who sat at the front of every class. And so I knew that not only did I lose my hair, but I lost my love of learning. I lost my love of life. I lost my close relationship with my friends. And I knew that something needed to change, like in a really serious, substantial way, I needed to take care of myself and I needed to get help. And so I started by um, not only identifying the thoughts, but flipping them on their head. Every time I thought to myself, I'm all alone, I would tell myself instead, people care about me. Anytime I told myself I was trapped, I would remind myself I can do anything. And these are just some of the examples of the things that I did. I also reached out to local teachers. Um, I started to get involved in leadership at my school to like start to um, get out of the house and use my voice to speak up and build my confidence. And I also, um, you know, asked my parents for support and friends for support um, and started seeing a counselor. So I knew that in like a really serious way, I had to take care of myself. And eventually I was able to change the negative into the positive. And I realized that confidence does not mean being perfect. It meant loving myself even on the imperfect days. Um, and eventually that led to this beautiful, beautiful feeling called freedom. Um, and I was just so happy to feel free, free from insecurity, free from self-hatred, free from all of these things that were weighing me down. Um, and when I felt I had the courage to do so, I posted a video on social media, just going without my wig, sharing my story. And I had no idea what kind of impact that would have. Um, but I had hundreds of people reaching out. That video kind of went viral and people were telling me that because you went without your wig, I had the courage to, um, you know, go without makeup or get help for my mental illness or talk to my parents about how I was struggling. Um, so many high school and middle school students were reaching out and telling me that my story made a difference. And so I knew I needed to spread this mission even farther. Um, I decided that I wanted to help other students in my circumstance, and I created a nonprofit that promoted self-love, and I wanted to do that particularly for students because I knew what it was like to be a student with very little self-love. Um, and so we came up with our programming topics and core values, including identity, mental health, courage and vulnerability, and anti-bullying. Um, one of the first ways that we got started was by celebrating an international day of self-love on my campus. I thought to myself, if my self-love could inspire so many people to be themselves, what would happen if everybody practiced self-love? If everybody showed up as who they are, could we create um, a campus culture change? So through my Interact Club, we hosted an international day of self-love on my campus. We put positive post-its everywhere. We had mental health programming. We had um, school counselors available. We had different um, topics such as anti-bullying covered in classrooms. We dedicated a campus day to self-love and it was a really, really beautiful day. Um, and I did that through my Interact Club. And actually, fun fact, I needed about $500 to make it happen and start to scale it. And so uh, my Rotary Club donated the first $500 to my nonprofit as well, which was a really, really beautiful story. Um, so again, my Rotary Club was the second donation, actually. The first was my mom. I remember she gave me $50 and said, go, go live um, how you were meant to. Um, I did RILA. I was Interact president for three years. Um, I've spoken to um, several Rotary Clubs and been the keynote speaker at several district conferences. Um, I'm actually traveling to Dallas, Texas, um, not this weekend, but next weekend to speak at their district conference. So um, I've, I've really gotten to share with Rotary the impact that they've had on my life. Um, here's my mentor from Ryla, who actually ended up going to the same college as me. Um, here's one of my best friends who I share this story because she actually heard me speak at a district conference when we were both high schoolers and then ran into me when we were both in college at our college dorm and we became best friends. So that's us at my graduation party. Um, so it's it's had all these common threads in my life. And I feel like that's what's so special about Rotary is that there's all these connections that you, you don't realize. Um, and so it's really fun. Um, and I'll, I'll keep it short because I know I'm running a little bit out of time, but 
Um, my nonprofit's definitely also been able to have some amazing impact from programming um, on 150 campuses um, to reaching about 50,000 students per year. So it's been just such a pleasure to see this grow um, and to see myself grow through all these experiences. Um, what's next? I'm going to continue investing in my own self-care. Um, a lot of what I've shifted lens to do as an adult is I've become a keynote speaker. Um, and with every paid speaking engagement I have, I'm able to do one school free of cost. And I've continued to just stay involved. Um, I visited a lot of the DC Rotary Clubs. And when I get a little less busy, I'm, I'm trying to decide which one to join. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about kind of what I'm doing um, right now. But um, Last kind of lessons that I want you to take is where you hurt the most is where you can sometimes heal the most. Investing in young people can change the world and they really, really need your support. Um, when you make peace with yourself, you can make peace in the world. And I think that no matter what anybody's going through, um, you can really surprise yourself um, with your resilience and the human capacity for resilience. So I will leave it at that. Um, thank you all so much. I don't think I have time for questions, but I am happy to throw my contact information um, in the chat and I'm happy to um, engage with anyone after this. Please, please, please stay connected because talking to people after my talks and hearing from y'all is one of my favorite parts. So I wish I could be around in person to chat, but I will I will definitely um, happily share my contact information. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Oh, I know a short schedule today, but I'll find a way for us to figure out how we can do maybe just like a 30 minute Q&A on Zoom with you sometime. So yeah, absolutely. I always um, am available to come hop back on and do that. But, okay. Um, I put my email and website and uh, Dana, you can feel free to like forward it to as well. And I can send you um, the slides as well if you want to forward those. Oh, I will. Yes, I will definitely do that. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. You can see she's an amazing young woman doing some really incredible work. Um, and I was just really privileged to have the opportunity to work with her and get to know her a lot, a lot more during the time we spent together. Um, she's definitely, she's a doer, you know, and she makes such a positive impact. She did a, um, a webinar at my old company and we had, there's 70,000 employees. And usually when we would do a webinar that was like kind of a diversity, equity and inclusion focused type thing, you might get 20, you know, but we had like 80 and it had such a positive impact on people that then it became a, you know, everybody was talking about it. It kind of spread like wildfire. So we did another one and people were just connecting with her in a lot of ways for, for obvious reasons. So I will share that. And maybe there's a way we can figure out how to get her to come and present to Columbus schools, if that's, if it's possible. So 